I wanted to talk about Charles uh, the first of England and this is again getting into the kind of breakdown of the power of the monarchy after they've already eliminated the feudal order to, to by and large now they're seeing the power of the monarchy failing and they're trying to prop it up with this divine right of king uh, nonsense okay so James dies in 1625. Charles is the son, and uh, Charles comes to the throne. He very quickly marries the Catholic princess Henrietta Maria of France. Um, and early on, he issues the act of revocation uh, just as a prerogative. This is a, a, an exercise of the absolute power of the monarchy uh, that actually works, okay? So this demonstrates that the monarchy still has a certain degree of power, okay? And um, he revotes land grants made since 1540, back in the time of uh, Henry VIII, uh, to Presbyterian Scottish nobility. Now, he doesn't use this prerogative to target nobles within England who are Anglican, who are Church of England and conforming, he uses it to target nobles who are in Scotland, who by and large are somewhat like Puritans and they're kind of separatists because they believe in a different form of church governance. And this becomes very important as this story progresses. The Scottish believed in Presbyterian form of government, governance uh, for the churches, which was more democratic than the way that the Church of England did it. The Church of England did it much along the lines of the Roman Catholic Church, where uh, in England it's the archbishop, but of course in Roman Catholicism it's the pope. But here the highest authority is the archbishop and then of course the monarch above that. And so the monarch can dictate who is a bishop and who is a clergy member and, and all the way down. It's a top to bottom uh, directive. In Presbyterian uh, church governance, the elders, so certain people are identified as elders of, of, the, of a particular um, congregation. And then this goes up to the level of a parish and then of course, um, the, there'd be several clergy member amongst the parish. So you'd have these elders and, 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 and clergy members actually voting to see who is the bishop, who's the top person within their par parish. And then, you know, at another level, they could do that up to the level of, of higher bishops. Um, uh, it's more of a bottom up sort of structure. It's not entirely um, de democracy in terms of your average layperson uh, getting a vote, but, uh, but it's a great degree of, of democracy. So it's a, it's a different way of, of thinking about the authority of the hierarchy within the church and very influenced by uh, Calvinist uh, theology. Um, so he's targeting these Presbyterian nobility and the Presbyterian nobility, of course, are a challenge to the Church of England. So it's kind of a, it has this religious sort of angle, but also just there's a, this clear uh, cultural distinction between the Scottish and the English. Okay, so uh, and that's probably has a lot to do with why why um, James is able to get, or sorry Charles is able to get away with this, um, and then so he revokes the land grants, so they no longer have it as a hereditary endowment, uh, and instead collects rent, a yearly rent, in replacement for this you know hereditary title. 
Um, but then this introduces this whole money factor and undermines the feudal structure all the more. Okay, this continuously uh, under undermining the whole basis of uh, its own power. The monarchy just continues to dig out and, and create its own destruction. So Charles has a very contentious relationship with Parliament. Um, there's this duties of tonnage and poundage. This is for like imports and charging taxes, duties on, on the goods that are imported. And traditionally, uh, Parliament would grant that to the incoming monarch, you know, in the first session of Parliament and grant it to them for life. That's just, you know, just sort of a routine, sort of checking off the boxes sort of thing. This year, uh, this time around, Parliament only grants it for one year. And there's arguments as, you know, uh, Parliament wants to see revenue records from the past and see what's going on before they grant it. Uh, they want more insight into what's actually going on. They want more transparency in what's going on. Which suggests that maybe they thought there was some kind of corruption going on, or maybe there was overcharging, you know, and this could be a real concern, of course, you know, uh, members of the House of Commons, especially uh, might be merchants who are very wealthy, but not uh, nobility, who are running shipping businesses um, and feel like they're getting screwed, you know, so they want, they want the records on the table and they want to get this sorted out, you, you know. Um, <clears throat> so they grant only for one year. Um, and this is just, uh, you know, and, and then we also have the continuation of the whole divine right of kings thing versus the Magna Carta. That continues. Charles is asserting the divine right of king. Parliament is asserting Magna Carta. Uh, and um, Parliament has concerns over Queen Henrietta, a Protestant, or, or sorry, a Catholic from France. Uh, a significant number of the members of Parliament are Puritans. Okay, so maybe up to one third of Parliament is actually Puritans um, who are not even, you know, totally conforming with the Church of England. You know, they want, they're more radical than Church of England people and really don't like Catholics because uh, they're afraid that, because that's the thing that they don't like about the Church of England is it resembles too much the old Catholic way of doing things. Um, there's chronic royal debt and uh, Charles tries several times to get Parliament to uh, fund the debt with yearly, you know, even a sort of yearly allowance uh, for the king, you know, to sign off on it and they just won't sign off on it. And now this is when the disafforestation riots begin to, to break out. So this goes all the way back to Henry VIII when this, we had this explosion of the enclosure of the commons and the dissolution of the monasteries. When they started redrawing on the lines, also a lot of the forest, which had just been operating kind of like commons. Commons themselves were pasture land, primarily. They were land that was usable as is. Forests were like what they call waste. Um, it wasn't ready for cultivation. It wasn't ready for grazing. But, um, but people would nonetheless use the forest as a kind of commons, especially to run pigs, they like to say. Uh, where you'd let pigs root around in the forest and feed off of whatever they could find. You know, they're omnivores, will eat anything. And, um, and also uh, just to hunt small game and to take wood and, uh, you know, even manufacturing processes would, would depend upon cutting down trees in order to burn the wood in order to continue their manufacturing process. And this, um, kind of just went on, but as, as the commons began to be enclosed, also forests began to be redrawn. The, the lines, boundary lines and forests began to be redrawn and landlords began to 
enclose parts of the forest and convert them from their old purposes or even just run people off who had traditionally been living and, and using the forest in certain ways. And this turned into riots, uh, 1626 to 1628, so two or three years, uh, two, two and a half years, uh, it goes on. And, um, and then we'll see that there's a rash of these uh, later on down the line as well. <clears throat> Charles makes war against France uh, to protect French, French Protestants. Um, uh, and so in France, the Protestants were called Huguenots and he did launch a small campaign to try to protect them from persecution in France. Um, this is unsuccessful, but in uh, trying to fund this because parliament is being uncooperative with giving him funds of any kind. He uh, uses a forced loan uh, tax um, where he just used his royal prerogative and absolute monarchy to impose taxes, uh, especially for this purpose. Um, there were court cases uh, and the court found that the king did have this legal right to um, extract these payments and imprison whoever didn't pay them. Uh, so that was a reassertion of the absolute power of the monarchy. Um, he also uses the absolute power of the monarchy to impose martial law and force citizens to quarter and provision troops uh, as part of, of this campaign. <clears throat> and so parliament passes the petition of right And this passes uh, both cha chambers of, of parliament. And so it's reaffirming the Magna Carta. So we see the Magna Carta coming into play. The principle of habeas corpus. Um, habeas corpus is when somebody's imprisoned and you may, uh, you may not know where they are and uh, you may not know if they're being well treated Habeas corpus is where uh, a lawyer could come to a judge and ask the judge to issue a, a writ of habeas corpus, which means that the prisoner would have to be brought to the judge so the judge could inspect them and know that they're still alive and see if they're in good health and find out where they are and you know all these sorts of things. So that people couldn't be detained indefinitely in a kind of secret prison system which is a thing obviously that was happening, right? <clears throat> um, no person should be forced to give a gift or a loan or a tax that goes right back to those. Uh, and people can't be imprisoned without cause and quarter and provision of troops can only be uh, given as a free gift to the citizen, they can't be required to do it. And um, Charles uh, rejects it, but then is ultimately forced to accept the, the petition so that he maintains the support of the House of Lords, because that's now his main camp of royalists who still believe kind of in the divine right of king. They're, they're on his side to some extent, and he wants to shore up that. Uh, but of course, the House of Lords are very concerned about this uh, because as even as nobles, they were liable to this arbitrariness of the monarchy. And the House of Lords is becoming conscious as a class and saying, hey, we got to protect ourselves and establish our power against the monarchy. You know, it's just we can't rely on the monarch to do the right thing. And so that's a bit of class consciousness on the part of the House of Lords that we see demonstrated here. Um, which is again, one of the main themes I wanna sort of focus on. And, and now this becomes part of the, the law of England. Right? So this is a, 
one of those, again, I was saying, it was like a slow history of especially the nobles collecting power to themselves to protect themselves from the arbitrary power of the monarch, which is, you know, crystallized in one person. Really, one person can just, you know, out of whim decide things, um, puts them in a very precarious position at, at times. <clears throat> um, in the second scene of parliament, there's this issue of John Roll, who was a merchant who, um, who was importing goods and had his goods seized because he wouldn't pay the tonnage and poundage taxes, the duties, uh, because he knew as a member of parliament that they, the, that right hadn't been granted. And so it forces the issue. Um, and uh, this does become a controversy and, and Charles quickly prorogues parliament. That means dismisses parliament. He doesn't, uh, it means, okay, we're gonna take a recess and then I'll call you guys back later when, when I need you. you know? And this is part of the prerogative and the absolute uh, power of the monarchy was, was the ability to just dismiss parliament uh, whenever the monarch wanted. Um, and as part of this, uh, at the time, Charles has nine members of parliament arrested for the protest because they make a big show out of this um, uh, you know, holding the session longer, um, like really literally holding down uh, the speaker uh, of the house, holding him in his seat and not allowing him to gavel out the session until they voiced, voiced all these protests uh, about uh, Catholicism and customs duties. Okay. So he dismisses parliament, um, but then ultimately dissolves parliament. And the dissolving of parliament is when the monarch uh, dissolves a, a sitting parliament, which means there needs to be a new election. They don't have elections on, uh, on uh, any regular basis at this time. Later on, they will have some rules about so many years. Uh, there has to be an election, but, but even today in, in in uh, the British Parliament, um, uh, a parliament can be dissolved at any time and then a new election has to happen, even if it's been a very short amount of time. Uh, but you can prorogue or dismiss for a recess parliament and then the same members come back when, when you call the parliament back. Okay, but uh, at this time, Proroguing and dissolving was an arbitrary absolute power of the monarchy. Okay, so this is where the parliament and the monarchy are really fighting. And what Charles does here, and this really begins to set off the English Revolution, is that he rules without a parliament from 1629 to 1640. So he just has a personal absolute monarchy with no input from parliament for 11 years. And he starts to apply laws that have been in disuse uh, largely to raise funds. So this chronic debt crisis is an issue and just this need to raise more and more money um, because land wealth no longer functions the way it used to. He uh, uses something called the distraint of knighthood um, to find uh, knights who had not attended his coronation, which is their duty under the old feudal laws. But nobody did that anymore. But he would he find them for not showing up, even though it wasn't customary for them to do so. Uh, he used ship money taxes. Um, usually, it was only used during war and along in in port cities the ship money, but he applied it across the land, even inland during time when there was no war. Uh, so he's just uh, really manipulating these legalities, but, um, but in extraordinary ways that just don't make much sense. Um, he collects fees for grants and monopolies. So if you're like manufacturing soap, 
I'll say, okay, you're the only one who can sell soap in all of England. Give me some money for that large quantity of money. And so he's, he's establishing monopolies uh, for a fee, um, you know, just really not a, a, not a good idea for an economy, of course. Um, and he begins to now redraw the lines of forests again in more extraordinary ways so that even forests that had you know, maybe been cut or cut down around the edges, and then, and then people were having homesteads. Um, uh, assert, assertion, as they called it, where people just started living on a plot of land and built a house, and then traditionally it would just become their land. He goes back into the records and says, "No, no, no. This is within the forest, and now you're in the forest, and you need to get out." And starts kicking people off of their um, traditional homesteads um, on the edges of forests and enclosing them, selling them off, you know, and it just exacerbates the problem of the enclosure of the commons. And we have a series of disafforestation riots um, that break out uh, from 1631 to 1633, fairly widespread, as you see from, you know, um, these three different uh, primary locations. And then the, the big issue that, that Charles faces, which is his undoing, is the bishop's wars. So uh, these, this war, or series of wars, these rebellions, break out in Scotland. So remember I was talking about the Presbyterian Scotlands and how they had the different form of church governance that is more democratic. <clears throat> well, this is a this is where those that act of revocation comes back to haunt Charles uh, because now the nobles in Scotland are ready to make war about the revocation of their traditional rights of nobility. So they're very becoming very conscious as a class uh, against England and the Church of England. And they're going to assert their power militarily to, uh, to regain the power that they had just decades uh, earlier. Um, and in the midst of this, Thomas Wentworth, and, and there's more of this story again, this is this whole Irish Catholic connection that I, I don't wanna to get too deep into because it adds more details, right? Um, but uh, Wentworth is kind of a no notorious character in this whole time period. Um, he's the Lord Deputy of Ireland. And so he controls uh, Ireland as, as, a, uh, as a kind of colony. Um, and he offers religious freedoms to the Catholics there if they'll form an army in order to help with the bishop's war. So now we have an Irish army forming of Irish Catholics getting ready to invade Scotland. And in Scotland, they're building up an army to fight off this invasion. Um, and so this starts to create a, an interesting sort of dynamic that will in, unfold into the English Revolution, uh, where there's no going back for um, the monarchy. All right, so that's the end of this section, and I'll pick up with the English Revolution in the next, uh, in the next video.